good day to all i am mrs vinita assistant professor at khm unity women's college and i would like to share the standing of the poem landscape of the capybara river written by joao cabral de melo nito a brazilian poet the poem was originally written in portuguese and hence our study is based on its english translation but we'll try to explore it as much as we can using all available resources and for the general understanding of all my students out there i'm attempting it roughly in three sections so to start with we will have a, a basic understanding of the poet and his style in general deepthi can you move to the next yeah uh, before you get into any poem or to make it easy for you to study any poem i have used an uh, a small diagrammatic representation here which shows you two arrows now one means top down processing and the other one processing feel deeper understanding of whatever we listen to so to understand something that we are listening to we need to depend on two factors one is the phonological code phonological code means the words the phrases the structures etc used in the poem the second one is the context or the background information of the listener so let's also look at some of the basic details related to the writer and his background to enrich our understanding and on the the, the other part of the slide i have listed listed a few things that any one can try before studying a poem because eventually we are all supposed to become independent learners so the first step you must remember in exploring any poem is reading the text many times second one studying the title when we study the title it often provides us certain clues so for example if you're looking at the title the landscape of the capybara river you get a clue that this is something related to a river or the landscape the rest will come out as we pursue it further the third step is identifying the speaker now this does not mean becoming familiar with the biographical details and historical aspects of the speaker nothing like that as we read through the poem we feel that there is a voice emerging from the text is it a male voice is it a female voice what kind of or what age group is the writer in what is the ideology of the speaker such aspects is, is what we mean by identity or identifying the speaker the next one is trying to figure out the mood and tone of the speaker this will obviously become easier when you understand the first three steps are done this becomes more clear and the fourth step is identifying the themes Now, please do understand a single poem can convey multiple themes. It depends on our understanding of the settings, our understanding of the phonological components, our ability to connect with other poems and texts we have studied, etc., etc. And the last one, I sh the most important. This means the. means idea when it black and white it down understand wise you can paraphrase it or in stanza or or stanza wise help us out uh, a lot in gaining clarity to the text the uh, basic understanding about the poet his spelling uh, i have tried to pronounce it the way i have found out from the resources it's pronounced as joao cabral de melo neto he is a Brazil, was a diplomat and he was one of the most influential poets of late brazilian modernism of the post world war the second era he was a strong voice who expressed strong criticisms of literature of artists and of brazilian society through his poems he has been praised for his wit ontology metrical by 
intelligence we philosophical studies related to existence reality and the nature of being by metrical mastery we mean the mastery in his craftsmanship which is related to the skill of composition the choice of words the structure style of his writing and the capacity for inventive thought and quick understanding all these will come and mastery he has often been referred hence to as a difficult poet but don't be carried away by the word difficult the selection that is given to us is a very understandable one to get to the core of the poem an easier process because this poet has been related to words like surrealism concrete poetry constructivist poetry etc etc so let's try a small challenge to our own poetic sensibility to understand him more okay i've just displayed a few strips of colors on the slide what do these colors bring to your mind so getting back to putting a small trial on our poetic sensibility what do these colors bring to your mind just a few strips of green yellow and blue colors vertically placed one close to the other but are you just seeing colors or do you see something else in your mind do you see do you get to think about football times brazil world cup goals carnivals or even a man does ronaldo come to your mind so a color or an image can bring in many associations and based on these associations we develop a chain of thoughts and we give them meanings now let's try one more kitty think of river ganges now ganges means our river ganga this is how it is pronounced in english now what comes to your mind what are your associations does it bring in only divinity or geographical features of ganga or purity or quite contradictory to all these does it bring in a culture of pollution and indiscriminate overuse of natural resources so this is a special capacity of our brain a brain has a way of connecting images to multiple thoughts and images this is the simplest way i think i can make you understand the word imagist poetry or the surrealist images a picture bringing in a series of thoughts or like a collage so many other things come to our mind now this has been used in poetry too by many poets and this brazilian poet de melo neto has used this technique in much of his poems kitty de melo neto is considered to be in the poetic movement of the generation of 45 poets who was who were noticed for their austere style i use the word austere a u s t e r e which means very plain or serious and not at all decorative in terms of expressions and they are impressively severe or strict in terms of the content they dealt with i have used a word there constructivist poetry and generation of 45 or, or concrete poetry all these can help you when you go for your references hereafter now dimelo's poetry is refer constructivist poetry which is characterized by anti lyrical 
language. So I think the word anti-lyrical is self-explanatory. Something that is lyrical has a lot of elements related to lyrical poetry in it, which will be absent in this anti-lyrical language, which means they avoided or he avoided all excessive descriptions and subjectivity of lyrical poetry. His style has been connected to surrealism and images poets where concrete images and objects have been employed to create highly evocative compositions. Evocative, E-V-O-C-A-T-I-V-E -E means a poem that can generate very powerful feelings and emotions. So, a social reality that he, were, he has particularly reflected in his poems is the harsh landscape of northeastern Brazil, his native place, Pernambuco. It's, it's written P-E-R-N-A-M-B-U-C-O, but it seems that the Brazilian way of pronouncing it is Pernambuco, and the river is Capibarib. And there is another place that you can see in the poem, R-E-C-I-F-E. -E. That's another place that is related to the Capibarib River, which you pronounce it as Recife or Recife. Both are seen. Diti, please. The present poem that we are going to, the landscape of the Capibarib River, is the first part of a long narrative poem with the title The Dog Without Feathers. This is a translation and it is divided. The original poem is divided into four sections, as you can see mentioned on the slides. The first two sections are highly descriptive, focusing on the landscape of the Capibari River. So the poem is not only about the river, it is also about the landscape. It's an allegory of the river and its impoverished people. I repeat that statement. It's an allegory of the river and its impoverished people. So why I said this is for you to remember that as you follow the course of the river or the trajectory of the river mentioned by the poet, other sites should also become visible for you. Hit the next slide, please. The image of the poem, or the, the title of the poem, The Dog with Feathers, has meaning beyond its geographical features. It's a moral or a political meaning that can go beyond its interpretation. And so I'm reminding you once again to keep in mind the imagist style. The original poem is considered to be, I'm reading from the slide, a tightly woven long narrative poem in which Cabral turns to the physical and social reality of his native state, Pernambuco, and it is an allegory of the river and its impoverished people. So we are studying only the first part of this long narrative poem. So keep in mind, this, is, this can have other connections. Remember the imagist style of the poet and therefore keep in mind that we need to read between the lines and look for broader messages or occurrences or real world issues as you read through the poem. Please. Now, helping you understand why has he chosen the Capibarib River, it's important to understand the geographical setting of the poem. What I've displayed on this slide is the map showing the location of Penambuco and the way the river Capibarib is connected to the mainland and the Recife and before it empties itself into the Atlantic Ocean. So from here on, let's look at section two of this analysis. We try to analyze the poem both ways, bottom up and top down. Now study carefully the language used by the poet because
because uh, he considered his poetry more as a, a construction rather than a revelation. His attempt is always to create a pure and strict verse which uses language to create landscape rather than to announce them. His messages are tightly organized into a kind of poem machine that functions on its own. He composes his lines with logic and objectivity of a builder or a poet engineer. So getting into the poem, River Capibari mentioned in the poem is one of the most important landmarks of his native northeastern Brazil. City of Recife has very close connection to this river being on the coast and so does Pernambuco, which you can see on the map. So this is the factual geographical setting of the poem. Keep this in mind just as a basic ground to understand the rest. Siti, please. Cabral has a way of using multiple comparisons to bring out one specific idea. This multiple similes or using many similes and metaphors, comparisons to bring home an idea is seen in this poem as well. So if you look at the text, you can see the poem opens with a few similes and metaphors connecting the dog to the river. He says the city crossed by the river as the street is crossed by a dog or a piece of fruit by a sword. Him of the, the, it seems that the river is reminding him of the dog's docile tongue and sad belly. It may be the image of the river lapping the land. The dog's tongue is always wet and it is hanging. And we cannot imagine a dog without its tongue. So maybe he is bringing out how the land is unimaginable, how the land of Recife, Pernambuco, the northeastern Brazil, is unimaginative without recalling the river Capibari. So this way we can see that the dog is the central image that he has used in the poem. And in the third stanza, the river is said to be like a dog without feathers. The dog without feathers may be a way of showing deprivation. Normally, we don't date feathers with dogs. So it is suggested that the usage dog without feathers is a way of showing deprivation, both to the dissolute people living on the banks of the river and particularly the social fabric of northeastern Brazil. There is also a suggestion that the connection between the living and the non-living, the organic and the inorganic are all strongly established by this imagery, by these multiple imageries. You can see there is a dog and the street the fruit and the sword. So there, there is a non-living clubbed with a living, which these looks inconsequential, like the dog crossing the river looks an inconsequential action, but it is not so. He's trying to bring out that everything in nature has a place, has a value, but quite often we human beings fail to see that. Deepthi, please. The next, the poet is using a poetic, for poetic effect, something called cataloging. You must be familiar with catalogs. Cataloging is a, a, is a way of giving a list of things by a poet to give poetic effect. So in the next two stanzas, the poet is using catalogs and he is listing what the river knows and what it doesn't know. 
it moves from the pristine clear pure condition of water and river to the present with a series of listed items indicating that the river should not have known what it knows now so it's a contrast between what is the pristine original condition of the river and what it looks like now the condition of identified with the curve on the land the landscape the river river landscape cannot be forgotten imagist poetry concrete poetry constructivist poetry keep this in mind so what he is doing by this cataloging and by this images or the imagery is he is conveying an ethical or a specific moral issue through the images of nature animal life and catalogs so by using the cataloging and the images and colors in the first four to five stanzas the ethical reflections and moral issues have already brought to the mind of the river of the reader deepthi please in the next two stanzas the poet says that the river never opens up or in fish but instead in flowers to a flora squalid and beggarly in hard leaved mangroves if you look at the choice of words in this coming stanzas you can see that this is quite against the convent of using flowering now remember normally when we say the process of flowering it opens to beauty color and softness and texture unimaginable etc but here if you look at the choice of words the traditional flowering process is used in a contrasting sense by using the word squalid beggarly and gross etc so it is opening up not to the beauty of a full fledged flower but to a flora that is squalid and beggarly in hard leaved mangroves he uses black colors he uses the black americans curly hair even as a reference to this flow or the flowering process so through these images the course or the dispassionate river leads us to life in the north eastern brazil and its squalid or very bad living conditions a polluted ill treated river is equated to unequal social conditions in brazil between the different different zones or it may be the big divide among the people there the haves and the have nots the people who are privileged and the people who are not iti iti please in the next slide i have put down the consciousness racing now this is a question that features in your essay questions comment on the poem as a consciousness racing poem when question like this you have to bring in evidence from the text to show how certain images and imagery or colors are used to create this consciousness in the minds of the readers if you look at the lines that is said that the river bears its bloating poverty pregnant with black earth all these are related to the river losing its diversity the flowering becoming black and squalid or the octopus that it doesn't see any more all these are looking at the diversity that the river really losing so in the next stanza also also as the comparison between the dog and the river continues he says the river's childbirth is fluid and invertebrate like a dog's and it never boils in anger but in silence it bears the bloating poverty 
and use in silence uh, employed in here is black. So, besides the laws of its purity and fluidity, it is even suggested that the black represents the black people who, and those who are not listed anywhere in the economic indices of a great nation. I'll, I'll repeat that idea once again using the color using the color black he is not only representing the impurity or the losing purity but also he is representing the black people who live near the river and who are not listed in the economic of a great nation. So, this is again referring to the idea that the elements of nature are, are what supports human existence, but the human life that emerges from the very elements of human nature turns out to be destructive of its very this again may be construed as a larger theme of the poem and it is pointing to this through many lines. You can see words like cultured families with its backs to the river. So all these lines are showing how human beings are becoming inconsiderate of the elements that support the very existence of human beings. Deepthi, next slide please. The same idea can be seen continued into the next stanza, but here the choice of words become even more painful and heavy or poignant or richer with meanings. I have written it as the relationship between the words and life. Now, if you look at these stanzas, you can see the words used are connected to stagnation, thicker, warmer, trudging through, snake, etc. So, the trajectory of the course of the river is shown to reach a stagnation that is similar to crazy man's stagnation. So, crazy man is again a reference to how man is in a hurry to exploit and indiscriminately use whatever nature is providing. And it is, these lines are also referring to the stagnation of hospitals, asylums, prisons, of the dirty and smothered life. It is here that we clearly see the social fabric of Brazil increasingly incorporated into the poem. So, I have written a line there on the slide which is for you to understand a bit more easily. All these lines may refer to the, those oppressed people who not only by the social system or the economic system but by diseases and by the endless greed for their lands, the mentally ill people and the convicts who are forgotten in failed prisons and healing systems, or children and adolescents who live on the streets and spend their short lives again committing crimes and inevitably becoming drug addicts. Now, this is why we said the poem must be seen as a critique, C-R-I-T-I-Q-U-E, on the social fabric of northeastern Brazil. Diti, next slide please. The poem as it continues with the flow of the river, the stagnation of the river is extended to the human world. The image of, you can see images of sugar factories, 
hospitals, asylums of Pernambuco, the indifference of a modernized society to the very sources and elements that support it, the images of human beings turning their backs to the river, and the image of flies hovering over the river. You know that it's a common sight that we see all around us. When flies hover around something, it is an indication of a frightening reminder of filth, death and disease. So using these images, he is showing a river that has lost its ease of flow with dirt and silt, a river that has got little life in it now. So this river, this polluted river, is indistinguishable from the land and life that depends on it. Diti, next slide, please. Along the trajectory, please remember that the poem may be read as a strong criticism of Northeast history of social neglect or the governance of Brazil. You see that as the river yields in silence, there are many voices in the northeastern part of Brazil who are bearing silence, unable to protest. So through this poem, this is a kind of resistance or the poetry is becoming a voice of the oppressed. And you can see the fractured social system coming to light through the images that he has used and the images of decayed palaces eaten by mold and mistletoe and the obese trees dripping house and sugars all reinforce this image of neglect and desolation. So this is the social reality that the poem is representing. Now I would also like to add that uh, as, as a boy, the poet had grown up as a boy. He and of the deal the factory successfully at the same time to see the plight of those people who worked in it. So the reference to the big tree that is dripping sugar may also refer to the waste of all these industries that have clogged the river right now. So the very river that made the sustenance possible of humanity is now being clogged by the effluence or the waste that human beings create. And so is the life on the banks of this river. Deepthi, next one, please. Now we move on to the concluding stanza after a series of images and descriptive tactile imageries and images. We move on to the concluding stanza of the poem. Now if you look at the concluding stanza of the poem, the two concluding stanzas are rich or pregnant with Westerns. So the question that is asked may be more powerful than a statement that is made. If I ask, who doesn't know that? It implies everyone knows it. So study carefully every single question the poet poses in the concluding stanzas of this poem. And you will understand that these questions are not meaningless questions. It is an agonizing cry reflecting the poet's concern and his intention to put to think of a universal crisis. So if you look at the, the poem, you can see he refers to how maps are represented as blue, how, sorry, how rivers are represented as blue on the map. And his last question is, why then were its eyes painted blue on maps? So this is a question that has a, a, a strong, um, um, what should I say, an impulse to make the readers think. 
the river that is painted blue on the map is referring to the pristine life giving qualities of a river or any water source so even though he's talking only about pehnambuko or a river that we are not familiar with he is talking about the image of stagnation that has become part of every river around the globe so we can see that he is not actually trying to take us to brazil but he is trying to push everyone to think of a universal crisis i would like to use the expression thinking globally and acting locally thinking globally and acting locally he is bringing up a local river to open our eyes to a bigger crisis an imminent crisis that is awaiting each one of us so the concern of the poet <coughs> is not only about the fate of this one river this one river is something that he is familiar with but let this image take us the readers the youth especially you the students of literature to big the canvases so the last line is said to be the most evocative driving home the purpose of thinking critically and crucially why then were the eyes of rivers painted blue on maps it's something like a powerful wake up call to every human inhabiting the globe but he has used the familiar nambuko and hisifi which is the capybara river it so from here on we are moving on to section 3 of this presentation now why have i put this as section 3 because in the paraphrasing part or in your critical examination or analysis of any poem or if you look at module 4 of your syllabus you are supposed to be able to write a critical appreciation of any unseen piece of poetry as a part of studying the syllabus so in section 3 we are looking at the poetic techniques and the tone that he has used which must help you in writing more about the poem and the impact of the poem on the reader So he was against. I mean, the poet Cabral de Melo Nieto was known as a poet engineer. You know, when when you listen to the word engineer, what comes to your mind is precision in terms of measurements and choice of materials or numbers. This is exactly what he wanted in any poem. So he was against the use of exaggerated language in poetry because. he believes poetry to be a powerful tool to create reality so dimello was known as a poet engineer and his intention was to create the desired emotions with precise words and symmetry and the language of dimello has been referred to as anti lyrical now anti lyrical means his dismissive attitude towards everything that is sentimental and romantic so i i go back to the initial usage of the term surrealist imagist concrete poetry uh, uh, constructivist poetry etc which is primarily meant to bring in a stark reality of a social setup into a mind but while we are traveling or flowing through the capybara river deepthi next slide is also about the poetic style why it often critics say that his language might look unpretty or unpolished but this is not an accident this is something that he does deliberately because of the anti lyrical approach to poetry so something that is a poet that is dismissal of the sentimental and romantic he writes 
mostly about austere subjects, serious issues of subjects. In this case, he writes about the Capybara River, its pollution, its landscape, its inhabitants, generally the environment, trying to reinforce the message of misery. His language may hence look unpolished, but it is considered to be the perfect architecture that purposefully so that the two become the same or indistinguishable. When I say the two, I mean the linguistic element of the poetry and the social reality of the Capybara River. To blend both these into one, he has used this unpolished language or the perfect architecture as he calls it. Now let's move on to the poetic technique used. So poetry for him was only an instrument and through this instrument everyone must be able to see the world, especially the grim conditions of what the poet intends to. Now it is said that uh, I happened to read in some of the material that I went through that he became blind at a particular age. The moment he became blind, he refused to write any more poetry because what he believed was there can be no poetry without visual perceptions. I repeat, there can be no poetry without visual perception. So the moment he became blind, he decided not to write poetry. Now from that you can understand how strongly he believes in the purpose of poetry. Poetry is an instrument by which one could see the world. Cabral de Mello saw the world through his poetry. And I am sure he wants us also to see the grim conditions of his homeland and connect to our own realities through this poetry. It is said that he took poetry out of the literary salon. When we say taking poetry out of the literary salon, we mean that he took out the sophistications that were brought out and the complexity that was created by this sophistication of language. He removed poetry out of that purpose and placed it at the door of modern man, reflecting a unity between the linguistic and the social conditions. I think this is something that can strongly state the message of the poem, how a poem can bring in or how a poem can reflect a startling unity between the linguistic and the social conditions. Now, I'm sure you could see many aspects of northeastern Brazil without going through it. You could see the once flourishing sugar industry. You could see the once flourishing palaces. You can see the unequal distribution of wealth among the people. You can see the behavior of the rich and the poor. You can see the poor and the deprived people living along the course of these present polluted Capybara River who do not contribute to the economy of the nation. So these are all huge issues that can have global impact, not only to Capybara or to Pernambuco or to Recife. So this is what he believed to be the purpose of poetry. Now from here we move on. Yes, you can move on to the themes. So from here, I think it's easier for you to list the themes that are possible to be connected to with this uh, poem. Keeping this principle in mind, we can try to get to the core of the poem and the suggested possible theme. This line, one is environmental degradation. Remember, it is not only about one river, but it is about all rivers that are painted blue on the globe. This includes our Sindhu, our Ganges, our Brahmaputra, or whatever river sources that have flourished and nourished us. So environmental degradation may be one of the themes. Second one, the poem can be looked upon as a social commentary. Third one, 
it can be looked upon as man's interventions on nature which is quite ruthless and indiscriminate use of the resources which brings in the stagnation that they currently suffer the poem takes the reverse takes the readers from the river of his land to rivers of the world pointing out to a global crisis it can represent the illusion versus reality theme so this may refer to the data and the representation that you see in the world statistics so many people who are deprived of much of any nation's wealth live in these countries who never become part of the economic indices of the nation similar is the representation of the river it is painted blue but it has become black it is fluid but now it is stagnant it talks about growth and and uh, uh, development but on the other hand the reality is not that next slide please deepthi so these are all repetitions of what i just stated the degradation of the flowing river intertwined with the agony suffering tragedies and inequalities of human life or in short the river now knows what it should not know losing all its pristine qualities of and purity next slide please deepthi now can this now be called a consciousness raising poem i think your answer would be a big yes because through those images and tactile imageries and descriptions the poet be communicating and mobilizing the necessary strength in the public to transform social reality so keep in mind that you must know what is a social reality that he is talking about it is also communicating the necessary intelligence the logic and the strength the public must have so what was poetry for tabra di mello nito now you can use this also when you write about how the poem can be called a consciousness raising poem it is the exploration of the materiality of words and of the possibilities of organization of verbal structures things that have nothing to do with what is romantically called inspiration or intuition i understand i i hope you understand how much he is against lyrical poetry or the romantic rendering of reality which is a key feature of romantic poetry for cabral poetry was a tool and a method for exploring and understanding the world and the understanding of larger humanity and the larger place of emotions that we have to understand in it poetry is not meant for the heady flighty fantasy stuff of the romantic poets in the next two slides i have given you a comment that uh, jalal qadir has given on tabral di melo's poetry which i found very relevant when you are writing about the consciousness raising attempt made by our poet in this one he said that he was a sparing writer concerned with presenting the world as nearly as it is as possible there is little question that is sparse image driven poetry represents an important perhaps even crucial way of seeing the world now i hope when you paraphrase or when you write a critical appreciation of the poem you can bring in why he is considered to be a, a sparing writer concerned with presenting the world as nearly as it is possible because with limited images and uh, what should i say an economy of diction he has taken us to northeastern brazil the landscape the life the economy and the controversial concept of progress and next slide please deepthi now i have added a question here what are the, this for you to analyze to criticize and to synthesize now do not always go by what uh, what is heard about 
Now a real study or a complete study is when a reader is able to synthesize something out of what you hear. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of a deeply local poetry when it comes to trying to talk about the human conditions in general? Now this question, let me rephrase it, this means is the poet being successful in talking about a universal human condition by restricting himself to a local river and local poetry? Now, this is something you can think about. If your answer is yes, that is the success of this poem. If your answer is no, I think we must read more in between what the writer has inscribed. So, I would give you a clue on that, how to attempt this question. By using the local poetry and the local images, the poet is seeking the interconnectivity between the human and the non-human worlds. He is looking at the a kind of a nexus, the all connected concept of the world. Poetry is here seeking ethical solutions to a destruction man is causing to its very elements. The destruction man is causing to the very elements that keep, keep his existence possible. What is perceived as reality in the Poet's premises, which is northeastern Brazil and the Pernambuco River, thus must become a universal theme for us. So, after studying this poem, you must become, or every one of us must start acting locally. Every water source around us can connect us to this grim reality or an imminent crisis that is not to take much time to happen before our eyes. So I can, I also add a statement to this, uh, uh, the previous one, once again, so you can say that the poem is as much about our future as it is about our past. The future that emerges is a dismal one, an imminent one. Imminent one means something that has to happen, something that will happen. You cannot escape this reality and is environmentally apocalyptic. The word apocalyptic always frightens me because apocalyptic is something that prophesies a complete destruction, something of a catastrophic destruction for which every one of us can be responsible. Now, to get more on this, on page number 8 of your text, in the preface part, the editors have given you a, a very clear elucidation on what is the objective behind this poetry. So please make use of your text. The preface is very useful as well as the note that comes before the poem is printed in your text. Preeti. This is the original poem, The Dog Without Feathers. I have written there the Brazilian or the Portuguese term for it. I don't know how to pronounce it. O, cao, sem, plumas, maybe. Plumas means feathers. So both the river and the dwellers of such a place would be dogs without feathers, which is an expression that seems to define by means of an extreme paradox situations of complete destitution. Now, this is the larger essence of the poem, but we are studying only the first part, which describes the original condition and the present condition of the river. And on page number 111 of your text, you can see much more of material that can help you write in your own language. So I, I focus on the word paraphrasing of the six steps of reading poetry. Listening will not alone help to make you a thorough reader and a student of this work. It's a day to write it down. And wherever clarity is missing, the poem has much more to say. I think that was the last slide, Deepti. Thank you very much. And on the rest of the slides, I have printed the poem. I'm sure everyone must be having it. But just in case someone doesn't have the textual material, 
it must help uh, we, uh, hello. Uh, we, hello hello yeah uh, we have three questions okay please uh first one is first one is mm -hmm. why the author portray the author portray dog as the central image of this poem as the central image of this poem uh, if you look at the general studies of the poet it is seen that he is very fond of certain images he has certain poems like education by stone uh, a knife all sword so certain images seems to be his favorite one among his favorite image is or the images that he use is the dog in this poem dog is used as the central image maybe because i'm not sure about it i tried looking for this many places but one thing is the way that the dog is connected to the human beings what does the dog represent in your mind dog represents loyalty uh, gratitude love of its master and in terms of if you look at the rest of the lines of the poem you can see that the the poem is I mean, the the poem the river is like the dog in in the way it gives birth so dogs give birth in litters they give birth to many puppies at a time so i, I think many qualities like loyalty uh uh the love for its master uh, together as the dog would never leave its master these are all my assumptions otherwise generally it is said that the poet was fond of images from nature and animals and the lapping uh, the tongue of the dog that is again something that you don't see in other animals if i am not biologically an expert in in biology but i think the the tongue that is always seen hanging from uh, the dog's uh, face that again may be one reason why he used it it's always wet which is used to connect to the the possibilities of the land you cannot imagine the dog without its tongue have you ever thought of a dog with the mouth closed very rare times do we see that very rarely do we see that so one suggestion i saw in one of the comments is that maybe it refers to the ever lapping tongue of the dog it refers to the loyalty of the dog it refers to the um uh, um forever connection between or the a connection that uh, you cannot uh, fail to represent between man and dog dog has always been a favorite friend to the poet for friend to man so through the central imagery maybe he is connecting the water source to the landscape and the life that is associated with it like man can never be separated or cut off from the river that support him or the land does it help you yes yes ma'am yes yes ma'am uh, can, can i go to multiple questions? questions can i go to the second question yes please shoot okay to what extent okay. can what the landscape of the capybara river be seen, seen as the consciousness raising point that is what i had explained in the last uh, um, slide before the along with the themes now i said he talks only about a local river you and i reading it from india know nothing about the capybara river but the capybara that he talks about or the image that he creates with the capybara is connecting to the original condition of the flow of the river so by law the pristine fluid nature of the river should have been maintained but has it been possible in the name of development in the name of progress in the name of economy the capybara that was nurturing the land of the northeastern brazil has actually become stagnant and it has lost its flow it has lost its fluidity it has lost its color which means the changing condition of the river is a reflection on the changing condition of life so it refers to man's 
lack of concern for the very resources that support it. So reading through the poem, we are not actually seeing only the pristine condition of the river, but we see how the pristine condition of the river represented as blue on the map has now become black, become stagnant, has become deprived of what it should have actually been known. The river doesn't know of its fountains now. The river doesn't know about fish now. The river doesn't flower to pristine conditions now. All these have changed. So unless man acts right, the river will eventually die. So using all these images, he is actually showing the picture of an ailing river, a river that is losing its depth and breadth, it's losing its purity, is losing its life-supporting qualities. It is losing its diversity. Now, isn't that consciousness raising? Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, madam. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, the last question is, um, the last can question is, uh, um, can we share? Yes, what please. are the important questions that can what come? What are the important questions that can come uh, from this topic, from exam point of view? Uh, from this topic, from exam point of view. Okay, from an examination point of view, I have posted a few questions on the slides. Number one, how does the poet use a, a local uh, content to develop a conscious racing poetry? Number two, the poetic techniques of the writer. And another one I think you sh should remember is the poem, if you look at module three of your syllabus, the focus of this particular selection is environment. So if, if the examiners feel like asking how global poetry, how module three as a whole achieves the purpose of creating an awareness on environment through the selections given to you, I think this would definitely help them how environment is becoming a focus of this poem. So uh, I, I'll repeat what are the possible ones. Number one, the imagery or the, the, the poetic style and technique used by the poet. Number two, the thematic analysis. I have listed around nine possible themes which can easily be developed into a strong essay with a little bit of reading and don't miss the uh, preface page and Page number 111, the material that is given before the poem in their text itself. The description is very beautifully given where students can reproduce it. So use the textual material. Uh, and uh, so the uh, questions possible, let me go back to it once again. Number one, thematic and structural analysis of the poem. Number two, uh, landscape of the capybara as a consciousness raising poem. Number three, world poetry and the focus on environment. Um, what else? Then the poetic techniques in general, style, techniques, imagery, etc. used by the poet. Distinctive features of Ebral de Malo's poetry, all these can be looked at, I think. Uh, okay, madam, the questions are over. Do okay, we madam, need to add anything before winding up? Yeah. Now, what I would like to strongly suggest to my students watching this is, please don't be happy with summaries or paraphrases that you read here and there. It, it, when I went through the poem again and again, I must tell you, I fell in love with this poet engineer because one reading will not help you understand what is distinctive about this poet. But many readings, as I said in the first slide, the top down and the bottom up approach, if the more you try to know about the poet and the more you know, try to know about the poetic style and techniques, you can see the, the images and the imageries gain such a depth of meaning and understanding that you can write volumes about it. And one thing I would like to ask my students is, think about any one burning topic in your locality. It is not only poets who can write. Think about any one burning issue in your very local environment. Try to write a poem about it. What image, what descriptions do you use? Just fall in love with poetry. Poetry is such a, a, a beautiful area to deal with. Thank you all. Thank you, Deepthi, for your assistance. Thank you, the, the team at SAP as well. Thanks a lot.